Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Stuart Patrick. Uh, I'm Chief Executive of Glasgow Chamber of Commerce. I'm your host for this afternoon's Glasgow Talks. Um, and uh, I am delighted, as ever, to thank our sponsors for their support to uh, Glasgow Talks. That's Glasgow University's Adam Smith Business School um, and the Clydesdale Bank Virgin Money Team. Um, both of uh, our sponsors have been remarkably loyal to us uh, all the way through the pandemic and we're extremely grateful to them. Uh, we welcome to our event this afternoon, Jonathan Hinkles, the Chief Executive of Logan Air. I will introduce him very shortly. Just a couple of uh, house points uh, in the traditional manner. Uh, could everybody check? I think everyone is muted. I think they are. Um, once uh, Jonathan's uh, made his uh, presentation to us, um, we're going to have some time for Q&As, but you can ask questions um, throughout using the chat function, and I'll pick those up uh, as we get to the end of uh, Jonathan's uh, presentation. So you don't need to wait until Q&A get underway to put your thoughts on uh, record. Um, we're going to try and get as many questions as possible through uh, today. Um, if we run out of time, then we will get uh, questions to Jonathan after the event and come back to you with a response. So but there's going to be an opportunity to get a... Uh, uh, feedback one way or the other. Just to let you know also that today the session is being recorded. So, um, first of all, delighted, as I said, to welcome Jonathan, um, Chief Executive of Logan Air. He has been uh, a, a very familiar figure in and around the Glasgow scene uh, in, the, in recent years. He was formerly Chief Operating Officer at Logan Air, um, but returned to the company as Managing Director in June 2016, having spent four years at Virgin Atlantic, uh, where he held a senior role as Vice President of Operations and crewing. Um, there's been quite a lot happening. I'm not going to say a lot about what's happened since Jonathan uh, has taken on the managing director role. I don't want to steal any of uh, his thunder, but it's worthwhile, obviously, noting that 2020-21 um, has been a remarkably challenging year for aviation with the pandemic and the impact that it's had on the travel industry more broadly. Um, we at the Chamber are, I hope, constant uh, champions of uh, connectivity as a pretty significant enabler for economic growth. We are fundamentally interested in the role that aviation connections play in attracting investment, foreign direct investment from the states, for example, visitors, talent, uh, or for that matter, uh, supporting international trade. So we are very keen to uh, help uh, both Logan Air and of course our local airport in the recovery process from the pandemic. Um, Logan Air, as we all know, is based at Glasgow Airport. And we believe that that's uh, one of the most strategic assets for the city, for the region, and indeed for the country. Um, Jonathan is going to take us through, I'm sure, some of the issues that he's faced uh, overcoming what's been put on his plate by the pandemic um, and what steps the airline's taken to rebuild some of the confidence that's required to get um, uh, going again as restrictions are eased. And of course, we've just seen another uh, level of restriction lifted with the uh, EU and US passengers being entitled to come back into the country if they are vaccinated. So I also expect to hear a little bit, I'm sure, about Logan Air's uh, Green Skies environmental programme and uh, really look forward to hearing more about the aspirations that the airline has for that with COP26 on the agenda. So I'll shut up and I will pass over, therefore, to our special guest today, Jonathan Hinkles. Well, thanks, Chet, and very good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, I hope the technology holds up a bit. I was just joking with Stuart as we were uh, in the waiting room that the technology hopefully doesn't hold up too well uh, because glitches on Zoom and Teams calls are the kind of stuff that gives us hope that there will truly be a future for the airline industry uh, with people needing to meet face to face as, as we go on. Um, it's just over a year. I had to look back uh, as to when it was that um, uh, we last met at uh, Glasgow Talks event, and it was uh, a year and a month ago, almost exactly that. And I think, you know, during that time, it's been a question of uh, sort of hopes having come and gone as the uh, waves of the virus uh, have, have ebbed and flowed. And I'm sure that's been absolutely the same for everybody through every sector 
uh, of uh, industry, commerce, uh, and indeed everyday life. Uh, it really has been a, a tremendous challenge, but one that uh, we uh, have to hope uh, that we're on the way out the other side of. Though I think have been two constants through that um, time. Uh, the first of which has been to expect the unexpected, uh, because nothing changes, you know, nothing uh, sort of stays the same for very long, and it's a world of constant change. Uh, the second constant through that has been really complaining about government, uh, which has um, become a, a national pastime to replace talking about the weather. Um, I'm not going to do very much of that today. Um, frankly, I think, well, I could. Uh, I think it's incredibly boring to listen to everybody else's worries about government uh, and what they think they should and shouldn't be doing. Uh, and apart from anything else, I don't think there's actually anybody on the government from the government of any shape or form on the call anyway. So it'd uh, probably fall on deaf ears. Uh, there is much we could say. Uh, I think probably if I had one comment to make, though, before I get off that subject, is to say that if there was one tiny fraction of the time and effort that we're seeing and the noise that we're seeing coming out of government uh, about their completely appropriate focus on climate change and carbon emissions, if one tiny fraction of that same effort could have been applied to some of the recovery efforts, uh, then I think that would have been welcome. And that's a comment actually more directed at the Department for Transport in Westminster. Holy in time over the year, where you know an industry was injuring people ended the year by out of existence, uh, let alone by 2040 through technological development. So that's really been a, a, a key and enduring challenge over the course of the uh, of, of the last uh, 12 months or so. This time, for this time last year, uh, last March, um, we were um, really gearing up. No, sorry, <clears throat> Jonathan, we've just got a slight glitch at the moment. You're just coming back, though. Um, you are just gearing up. And you're, I think you're back. Um, got me? Yeah. yeah sorry, what about you lose me there? <laughs> yeah. You've got your wish, a, a little glitch there, just, uh, just to prove the point. <laughs> Whereabouts did you lose me, Stuart? Sorry I heard you, you, were, you were about to gear up, which was always going to be interesting. So uh, gearing up for, that was the last I heard. Right, sorry, let's, uh, let's, let's keep, uh, keep, keep battling along. Um, so yeah, I mean, really the government's uh, questions are something that have been uppermost through that time. And uh, really it is time for us to sort of move on and look to the future now. Uh, and uh, take on board large elements of what we've got. But last March, um, we were sitting here planning uh, how Logan Air would respond as the UK's largest regional airline uh, by default, really, given the collapse of Flybe uh, just before the pandemic kicked off, uh, as to how we were going to be taking over a number of Flybe's routes and uh, making sure that we were fit for the future ourselves. Instead, since that time, we've had to turn our hand to doing a lot of very, very different things. Um, we're now in a position today where our schedules are regrowing. So Logan Air is and remains the UK's largest regional airline. But actually now we're one of the busiest in, the, in Europe. Um, quite surprising to me that we're actually even on the air traffic control uh, dashboard uh, of the 30 busiest airlines in Europe, but we consistently have been. And last week, um, Logan Air operated 2% more flights than it did in the same week in 2019, uh, while other UK airlines on that tracker uh, are still far below. For example, EasyJet were 40 uh, and BA were almost 50%. Um, so in terms of what we've done to try and have a credible challenge for us, um, but it's one that seems to be yielding the right results. The ways in which we've done that have been a whole range of different things in turning our hands to, to different bits of business. And I suppose in many ways, it's no different to somebody running a restaurant or a hospitality business, who instead of welcoming people into their site have been doing takeaways and everything else. It's been the same for us. We've been using the resources that we have, our aircraft, our infrastructure, to go and deliver different things that we can still deliver uh, through 
effects of that pandemic. And uh, I think quietly but slowly that's been very successful. If I look at last night, uh, we had an aircraft that finished off working up in Arlesund in Norway uh, after dropping off a ship's crew in, uh, in Arlesund late last night flew straight down to Leeds Bradford today and it's now on its way carrying Wakefield Trinity rugby team uh, down for a rugby match against Catalan Dragons in Perpignan this afternoon and that's the same aircraft that literally has gone from top to bottom of Europe in the space of about 16 hours. Um, it's not the kind of thing that we would have thought we would be doing but absolutely we are and that business and those kind of opportunities and we've been knitting those together in exactly that sort of way have been incredibly helpful to us. On top of that, we've got a, a duty and a responsibility to maintain lifeline air links uh, to all of the islands, um, which has been a, a large part of what we've been doing during that time. And that extends through into things like mail deliveries. And there's been a whole load of work has gone on uh, around also trying to make sure that urgent medical shipments, whether it be radiotherapy shots, getting from Ragmore Hospital in Inverness out to the Western Isles Hospital in Stornoway, uh, have been able to continue traveling because the normal routes haven't been there. So a whole raft of things like that that we've done uh, and that we've become kind of unwitting experts on all of the minutiae required to make that happen now uh, in a way that we probably weren't before. We've also, uh, during that time, and I think we just started this uh, as we were speaking this time last year, been providing an aircraft on permanent standby for the Scottish Ambulance Service. Uh, this morning, uh, we received a very welcome news that the certificates that we need for that to become a permanent fixture from the Civil Aviation Authority have been received. It's been operating under a uh, temporary uh, permissions of, uh, really on basis of national need. Um, but now uh, we've the modifications to that aircraft uh, to uh, be able to permanently use it as an air ambulance uh, have come through finally this morning. Um, and that's something that's had a lot of use outside of the pandemic. We have carried a lot of COVID patients and we've been seeing pictures of our crews coming back in full head to toe PPE and uh, gloves and masks and everything, you know, out operating in their daily life, which is very different to the normal sort of tartan uniforms that, uh, that we have in Logan Air. Um, but they've, they've done fantastically well with that. But it's also been used for other things. And this is where it really has a role continuing long into the future. For example, carrying bariatric patients who can't fly on the normal smaller aircraft that's the air ambulance uh, to get to and from hospital appointments. So it's been, a, again, a, a huge learning curve for us, getting all of that into place uh, and making all of that happen. And um, agility, I think, has probably been the key uh, to us getting through uh, the last uh, 15, 16 months since the beginning of the pandemic. Today, all of our aircraft are out of storage. Um, we have restarted all of those former flyby routes. So Glasgow to Southampton, uh, Glasgow to Exeter, all of those kind of routes where there are very long distances, which aren't easy to travel by, uh, by surface transport, but where there are key business links backwards and forwards. Um, sectors ranging from defense, uh, maritime, uh, the Met Office down in Exeter, all of these people traveling backwards and forwards. And we're pleased to see that those links are in place. There are fewer customers using air services today. I don't think that will come as a surprise to anybody. Um, probably from Logan Air's perspective, we're about two thirds, maybe 70% of the way back to where we would uh, expect and hope to be. And there've been a few factors within that that we've been working hard to understand. There's been much talked about the staycation and domestic tourism. We have seen an increase in that. Of course we have, given the type of routes that we fly predominantly domestically in the UK. There's less business travel. And of course, there's virtually no international travel. And for us, that is still important because international travelers flying into Scotland, using Logan Air's flights to connect onwards to the Highlands and Islands, and also people from the Highlands and Islands traveling out, whether it be for holidays, whether it's to go visit friends and relatives abroad, they're not doing that at all. So the staycation increase has not uh, fully compensated uh, for that drop uh, in international travel. And it really is critically important for all of us that we get international travel uh, back up and running again uh, as soon as we can. And uh, it's been uh, encouraging to see yesterday's announcements from government uh, about the way that that will go and some of the steps that are now being taken to get there. I could complain they've been too late, but they're coming. Uh, so let's make the best of it now it's here. So really, I guess, one of the biggest questions for us now is to what extent the business travel market will return. 
July and August are historically very quiet for business travel, as you can actually expect. But come the beginning of September, are we going to see business travel uh, coming back again? And at what sort of volumes will it? We do expect that some of the business travel won't be back in the same volume as it was before. I think the days where you used to run into people who kind of set off from home on a Monday morning and travelled up and down the length of the country uh, before getting back home again on a Friday night, uh, those people have had a big change in lifestyle and have understood what it's like being at home all week with family. Uh, it's probably one or two desperate to get away from that, but so the vast majority, I think, have uh, seen the benefits of it and they probably won't go back to travelling uh, in the way that they did before, but some travel will certainly be there. So we are basing our plans around the fact that there will be a reduced percentage and we've looked at each and every route within the Logan Air Network to understand what that may be. And we're trying to shape a business around that. But of course, we're still learning. We've never been through this before. Uh, and we've never sort of looked at what type of impact this has got on the uh, aviation industry uh, and how long the recovery may be. So uh, it's requiring a tremendous amount of uh, sort of skill and um, uh, to some extent, seat of the pants flying from Kay Ryan, our chief commercial officer, uh, and her team as they're kind of working through this and putting the jigsaw puzzle together as to where Logan Air's aeroplanes are going to fly, um, how often they're going to fly, how much we're going to charge for each ticket, uh, and all of the aspects that go into uh, making uh, our business fully tick, uh, which then uh, Morris and Kieran uh, from our operations and technical side then go off and deliver uh, to that. So it is going to be interesting. Within that as well, we've got uh, the other things to contend with, where I think one of the biggest threats to the aviation industry right now uh, and probably over the next 12 months will actually be itself. Um, we have a number of competitors who are doing things that are um, uh, bizarre, um, literally piling aircraft into the UK domestic market and flying big 180 something seat airplanes around with 20, 30 passengers on them as they're trying to fly, find places to be able to fly those airplanes. That is having some impact on Logan Air as a business. I think it's having far more impact on them as a business. Um, but, uh, you know, there'll be a question as to whether we will eventually get uh, an outbreak of sanity uh, from some of the more outlandish things that we're seeing from uh, one uh, carrier in particular. I think across the airline industry, the three big low cost airlines operating in and out of the UK, one of them acting very rationally in a measured, controlled way. One of them has come close to losing control and is taking some pretty judicious steps to get back there. And the third one of the three, I think, has, has lost control of its business. And unfortunately, they just haven't realised it yet, um, which, which takes us back to the old maxim of a guy called Bob Crandall, who used to run American Airlines, where one of his popular sayings was that the industry was always in the grip of its dumbest competitor. Uh, and uh, I'm afraid that we have got a little bit of that about uh, at the moment, but uh, I'm hoping that as international travel starts to return to normal, there'll be some semblance of rationality returns to some of the decision making uh, that we're seeing in certain quarters uh, of the airline industry today. So that's uh, something which is a threat that we've got to manage alongside everything else that we're doing uh, as well. All of this, of course, has placed a, uh, a tremendous strain and pressure on our whole team. Um, all of our aircraft are now back out of storage. All of our team are now returned from furlough. And um, sadly, last autumn, um, we had to say farewell to around 85 members of the team uh, through a combination of voluntary and involuntary redundancies. We just did not see those jobs returning um, at the end of the pandemic. And uh, we were, I, I think, that very sad um, uh, course to go through. We left it for as long as we could uh, uh, and uh, as late as we could to actually do that, where other airlines right at the outset of the pandemic were in a cuts right from the outset. Um, we thought it was the right thing to do to try and tide things through as far as we could. And we got to the point last autumn where we could take it no further. Um, what I am pleased to see is that already we've been able to find opportunities for some of those people to rejoin Logan Air. Uh, and so it's a uh, sort of great delight when we're able to welcome them back to the company. Uh, and I hope that over time we'll be able to do so with far more of that group. But we were able to avoid further redundancies, which were a real prospect going through last winter um, through working very closely with our employee groups. And I have to say they have been absolutely fantastic. I could not have asked to work with a better team. And from uh, where they have been, uh, you know, in COVID, several months of reduced salaries. We've got everybody back to 90% of pay uh, in April. We're going back to 
percent of pay for everybody in September. Uh, and from what I hear from our uh, union representatives, we're the first UK airline in that context uh, to return to normal, where many airlines have still got huge numbers of staff on furlough, uh, and those who are working are doing so at vastly reduced pay. Um, so it was um, uh, an interesting and unexpected comment when we're receiving uh, compliments from our union reps on finding new business to keep our aeroplanes busy. Uh, and uh, from one of them saying, uh, sat in a meeting and said, well, I'd just like to say thank you. And I said, OK, what for? And he said, for doing what you said you will. Not many people do that in our line of business. Um, so, you know, that's been encouraging that we've been able to uh, maintain those relationships uh, with our uh, union representatives. And indeed, most importantly, actually, uh, our employee groups. Um, I think a key to doing that for us has been communication. Uh, and just keeping that going, whether you get any response to it or not, but just keep providing updates to people, keep letting them know where we're at. So we've been uh, keeping up with our weekly Friday uh, podcast, about an eight to 10 minute update that goes out every week uh, that uh, sort of works uh, very well. Because of course, we've got employees based from Shetland in the north uh, to uh, Teesside and the Isle of Man in the south and across to Derry uh, in the west. So it's a fairly disparate spread. And we've been doing that through the podcast, which is a long-standing thing in Logan Air before the pandemic, but also kind of weekly dial-ins uh, that we do with all of those groups as well. So a couple of hours on a Wednesday set aside uh, normally for that, just to talk to everybody. And it's a two-way thing, find out what's going on, talk about the key challenges we've got. And I think, you know, you can never measure that very well, but we had an opportunity to do that through our staff survey that we did back in April. Um, so over three quarters of our people took part in that, which I think is, is a good yardstick, according to the way I understand these things go. Um, but over 90 percent of them said that they understood all of the key challenges facing Logan Air as a business as we come out of the pandemic. And I think that is a you know, recognition that the communication and the work that we've done uh, alongside of all of our people has hopefully landed home. Uh, and actually our scores for things like I'm proud to work at Logan Air, the highest ever level up at 88% across all of these surveys that we've done. Uh, and I intend to be with Logan Air in the future uh, as an employer, it's highest ever level as well. Um, so it's uh, say very rare that you have an opportunity to measure that. Um, but when we have measured it, I've been really, really heartened by the results. Um, but it's been, a, a, I guess, a, a team effort to support each other through all of this whether it be through the work our mental health first aid teams have done, which has been absolutely incredible to support those who've been most in need, uh, and whether it's just been really sort of, act, I guess, acting as sort of cheerleaders, trying to keep spirits up all through the dark days of uh, much of what we've had uh, over the last few while. Um, we've actually got an interesting um, uh, project ongoing at the moment, which is the filming of a documentary for BBC Three, uh, all about Logan Air. So we've uh, uh, mentored media film crews in uh, following about 12 of our people uh, through their everyday lives in Logan Air at the moment, uh, hopefully airing next year. So that brings with it its own uh, risks and challenges. So of course, one never has editorial control over uh, what's going to be shown. Uh, pretty much if they've seen it, uh, if they've uh, shot it, then they can screen it. Uh, and that's the way these things go. Um, so it is an interesting debate amongst the management team saying, should we go for this? But we've decided to and have every confidence uh, that uh, that will hopefully portray uh, Logan Air, but most importantly, all of the people within it uh, in the light that we very much wish. But we also do allow our people a lot more latitude around social media than many companies do. Uh, quite a lot of companies got an absolute ban on it. From our perspective, we set the tone as a management team uh, in terms of our own activity and what we do. And we do encourage our people where they've got things to say or great things going on within Logan Air uh, that they can do so. And uh, they respect those ground rules uh, incredibly well. Uh, and I think that uh, is not something that comes out of a policy uh, or an HR uh, system. Uh, it's something that comes out of a right set of behaviours going right the way through the organisation. Uh, and they are absolutely fantastic ambassadors for us uh, across that. And it's uh, great for me as well to keep up with uh, much of what they're doing. So I think from a people perspective, uh, from a root network perspective, that gives us a very, very strong base uh, to build back from. Um, we are expecting uh, that uh, our turnover will get back to just slightly below pre-pandemic levels this year before growing further uh, next year. But from a financial perspective, which, of course, is one of the other big, big challenges facing our industry, um, we are in an entirely sustainable position. Um, it's not a particularly exciting position, 
but having done a refinancing with the full support of Clydesdale Bank, uh, who've been bankers for two decades to Logan Air uh, and the company's owners last uh, July, uh, pretty much in the early days of the pandemic, um, we're not needing to refinance or refinance uh, in the way that many other people are having to do uh, in business. We did it once. Um, I think we did it well. Uh, and that stands as incredibly good stead. So I was talking to uh, the Civil Aviation Authority who monitor the financial fitness of uh, airlines across the UK. They said, how do you think you're doing? So I said, well, I think we're probably in the least bad position of any UK airline, uh, to which they kind of nodded and said, I think you're probably right. Um, so, uh, you know, that's uh, uh, sort of where we are uh, on that front, which is, again, uh, stable and solid in as much as anything can be at this point in time. Uh, base uh, from which to build back. I think another really important aspect just to touch on it though will be building back from an environmental perspective. Um, it's something we've done quite a bit of work on uh, on the way through the pandemic and we announced uh, about uh, two months ago that Logan Air would be introducing its own uh, environmental management program. We called it Green Skies, which we have trademarked by the way, um, but it comes in two uh, real uh, chunks. The first of which is to say the technology that we need uh, to go uh, fully uh, carbon neutral uh, doesn't yet exist uh, in our industry. It's under development, and I'll talk about that briefly in a moment. But uh, the only way in which we can do that for now is to offset the emissions from every single Logan Air flight. We started doing that from the 1st of July, and we also started doing that in a way which I think no other airline has yet done, but I suspect many others will which is by reflecting a pound in every single ticket price, which is going to fund that carbon offset programme. We couldn't have done it without doing that, uh, given where airline business is uh, as a, a wider span at the moment. But we think it's right to create that link between the uh, economic cost of flying and the environmental cost of flying uh, in the way that we have done. And uh, certainly the response to that from the uh, politicians who we briefed on it uh, before announcing it from many of our business customers uh, has been a very strong one. It takes care, particularly from a business travel perspective, of that headache about can I go on business travel because is this consistent with my company's carbon uh, policies? We take care of that for you now through every single Logan Air flight without exception uh, and without qualification. So that's a first step. Um, and I think that will be a first step that will have to remain in place for quite a while until we get to a position where electrical and hydrogen powered aircraft become the norm on our kind of regional routes. I don't think that technology will probably work for long haul uh, air services um, because the physics of the amount of uh, batteries that you need to plug together and wire uh, probably just don't work to deliver large Airbus aircraft or Boeing aircraft on intercontinental flights. But for us, that's absolutely the way that we can see things going. I'm really delighted to see that the first electrically powered aircraft will be up in Orkney. Um, it should be arriving there tomorrow. Uh, ahead of uh, um, certification and starting to do test flights on a non-commercial basis around the Orkney Islands from the middle of next month. That will be flying the same routes within the islands that Logan Air has flown since 1967, um, and uh, but doing so uh, on electrical power. And I think it'll be a great learning curve for both us uh, and the manufacturers of that technology in terms of what it takes, not just to get an aeroplane off the ground with battery, but all the things around actually servicing the aircraft between each flight. We'd normally refuel between each flight. Well, you're not going to be doing that. How do you recharge the batteries? How does all this work? Uh, and getting that to learning at a very, very early stage into Logan Air. So it's something I think we're blessed to be in that position. It's deliberate that we've chosen to be part of those programmes as well, to get that learning into Logan Air at the very earliest stages of that, uh, which is really the next sort of leap of faith for the industry. And the hydrogen powered development will follow that as well. So by 2040, um, we will be uh, carbon neutral across the whole operation using those types of technologies and, of course, anything else that comes along between. But I think it's a step where people are increasingly conscious of the environmental impact of flying. And I think it's a great thing that they are. Um, I think also there's an element that the whole transport industry, whether you're running um, uh, ships, uh, whether you're running uh, sort of relatively old diesel technology on the railways, the whole transport industry has got a job to do around taking emissions out. This isn't just about aeroplanes, because actually, if you're flying up, for example, to the Orkney Islands, your emissions on a Logan Air flight today will be around nine times less than if you drove up to Aberdeen and got on the ferry. 
um, because the ferry um, pollution really is at that level. It is, it, it is intense. So there's a job to do across the whole sector. It's not about chucking rocks at each other. It's about trying to say, right, how do we all get there? And it's something that Logan Air, as the UK's largest regional airline now, we have a responsibility, but we think it's absolutely right uh, that we actually take a, a proactive lead in that, uh, in the way that we have. So it's certainly been a, a challenging old path of it. Um, and um, really, you know, we're not out of this yet in terms of what's going to come along from there. But there's a milestone that we are very much looking forward to at the beginning of February uh, next year, which is Logan Air's 60th birthday uh, on, the, uh, on the 1st of February. Um, I think um, with all due deference to the, I think, seven uh, preceding chief executives over the 60 years of Logan Air, uh, that there have been. Um, I, I hope uh, those who are still with us today uh, and also those who have departed would not strike me down for saying that the 59th year has probably been the most bloody challenging uh, through the airline's entire history. Um, but it's one that uh, I'm pleased to say that, uh, you know, we've, we've come through um, and I think we've come through in a form that positions us uh, as well as we possibly can be uh, for the future. And that's a future based on what we know today. By tomorrow, inevitably that will have changed again so we will have to change with it and we'll have to keep doing what we've been doing uh, over the last uh, course of 15 16 months um, which is adapting constantly being agile uh, and making sure that we're still providing the best stability uh, that we can for our customers uh, for our employees and above all delivering that air services uh, safely and well throughout the whole of scotland uh, and indeed the rest of the united kingdom uh, and the uh, the fourth bit the only one we don't serve rejoins our network on Monday when we resume flights to Cardiff as well. But thank you for listening. I'm very happy to take questions and uh, any comments uh, or any themes that either I have covered uh, that you'd like to know a bit more about or any themes that I haven't covered uh, that you may wish to ask about. So I'll hand back to Stuart. That's me unmuted. Thank you very much indeed, Jonathan. That was a really good coverage of, uh, of all that you have been facing in the, in the last year and a half and um, particularly encouraging signs in terms of the recovery to the, the level that you were pre-pandemic and some really interesting messages around how you've engaged with staff and uh, and the, the response you're getting from the team um, and also the, the comments around the environmental challenges that you are rising to uh, as a company. Great to hear that from a Glasgow-based company uh, leading the way in tackling one of the perhaps one of the better known challenges of the uh, of the environmental climate change agenda. So I'm going to open it up for uh, questions and comments from uh, our audience. Um, I will, I've, I can see a couple of comments, questions have come into the chat and I will uh, turn to those. I'm going to ask one question though, just to start it off. Uh, and then I will turn uh, to those of you on the call. So please, I'm giving you a, a, a minute, two minutes to two minutes to get your questions coming. Uh, please raise your hand uh, and I will uh, come to you. So my question is, um, Jonathan, is, is we, we're obviously we've all gone through huge behavioral change and you were talking about the challenges that you may face with business customers coming back, but for all customers, there must be an element of uh, confidence rebuilding in what the, the, the experience of being on a, a, a flight looks like many folks wouldn't have been on a flight since March last year. What's, what, what sort of uh, uh, issues do you think you're going to have to tackle? How are you going to go about rebuilding that confidence? Well, it's been absolutely key, although I think we are seeing a change again in behaviours now that people are much more prepared to, to go and get on an aeroplane, which is great. Um, last uh, May, uh, beginning of June, we were the first UK airline to mandate the wearing of face coverings on our flights. And um, we did that really because a lot of the airlines weren't flying. They weren't experiencing the same issues that, that, we, had, that we, were, we were seeing. And we woke up one morning to some scenes from one of the few other airlines that was still flying, plastered all over the BBC news about a nearly full aeroplane. And oh my God, how terrible this all was. Um, so thankfully, um, last beginning of last May, we'd put in a big order for um, face masks and PPE to, to be able to provide that to all of our customers because we thought this is going to come so let's get ahead of the game and we did 
So there was a, a Thursday and a Friday where we were all sitting around the boardroom table with our face coverings on, on a production line of packing packs to give out to every single customer as they boarded. So of course, at that point, very few people actually had their own, uh, which is now, you know, even in that short space of time, it's unthinkable, you know, the, the, the progress that we have where everybody's got a sort of whole collection of them with them at any time. That wasn't the case. Um, we had a decision to make a couple of weeks ago about whether to keep that policy uh, in place. We decided that we would, um, even though uh, in England it's no longer part of a legal mandate. But uh, there are a couple of reasons why. We think that people uh, will very much uh, want that reassurance, uh, particularly if they're in an area of, um, you know, an aircraft, albeit there's excellent ventilation in the aircraft. Um, there is, um, uh, you know, not, not two metre space between each person uh, on the aeroplane. So we've kept it in place for that reason, because we think that's what our customers want. And the feedback that we've had certainly shows that that's the case. Um, but also there was a complexity reason. We have a flight every morning that sets off from uh, somewhere in the Shetland Islands, works its way south through Aberdeen, carries on to Manchester and carries on to Newquay. Now, where in that across several changes of borders, if you boarded at Sumbra and you're getting off that aeroplane at Newquay, where and when do you want your face mask on or not? It's just a nightmare uh, logistically. So we just said, look, very simple, very straightforward policy. We're going to keep that in place, just as we have kept the enhanced cleaning regimes in place for our aeroplanes as well. Uh, and airports, indeed, have kept those measures in place as well. I think it's going to be quite some time before those um, fall away. Uh, and I think it's probably appropriate because we do need to provide that reassurance to people uh, that it is safe to go and get back on a plane. Um, we've actually got quite a big step coming up this Sunday where we're restoring in-flight catering for the first time since last October. We had a short run of it last summer, but then took it off again as the pandemic uh, increased. Uh, so that will be back on board from Sunday. Uh, albeit, I have to say, one disappointment and a reflection of the times is that it won't be exclusively tonics caramel wafers on our aeroplanes um, because uh, they, we haven't got quite enough to supply everywhere in our route network with them uh, because of, uh, sort of supply shortages coming out of uh, out of Huddingston. Uh, so hopefully that will sort itself out sooner rather than later as they're almost a bit of a Logan Air trademark. Um, but I think there's another important point as well. Um, I've flown uh, a lot myself uh, through, through the pandemic, uh, which is a function of kind of split households uh, in one, uh, one way, um, but also um, around uh, sort of needing to travel for essential purposes. And a lot of the time when you've gone into the airport, you're looking around when you're walking in thinking, am I supposed to be here? You know, with sort of hoardings up everywhere and bits of the airport closed off and some of the smaller airports with absolutely nothing open. Uh, you know, cafes, shops, absolutely nothing. Uh, and sitting there thinking, well, where can I even get a water from? So I think there is a point that even though airports are running at reduced pelt, and that's completely understandable, we need to try and make what is running uh, feel as though it's an atmosphere that customers should be in. Otherwise, you're walking around at times thinking it's like some of those kind of sort of, you know, walking around the aftermath of Chernobyl and you're an intruder, you shouldn't be there. And the sooner we can get that feeling of being in an airport feels like something normal again, even if it's only in a small fraction of the airport, as opposed to the whole estate, uh, the better that will be in terms of joining up, uh, that travel is normal, travel is acceptable, uh, and uh, travel is safe uh, from a customer's perspective. So we've got a job to do with all of our airport partners on that front as well. First class, thanks very much. Alan, can I bring in um, a question, or Derek, uh, from the airport has asked about the mandatory wearing of face masks and I'd quite like to bring Derek in so if we can unmute him and, and let him come in and uh, uh, develop that question uh, further. Thanks Stuart, hey Jonathan and uh, just back up on Jonathan's last point around retail and the airports you know we fully agree um, things will change very quickly as people start to travel again their expectation is changing really, really quickly. And these are ongoing discussions we're having with retailers just now about trying to get the world as normal as, as possible, as quickly as possible, even as Jonathan says, in small areas. With regards to the airports then, yeah, we've got all of the safety measures in place, including mandatory wearing of face masks. In Scotland, it's mandatory by government decree. In England, it's mandatory by the airport itself. Uh, so our airport down in Southampton uh, is mandatory. 
But of course, the key thing in there is within the airport, we have to be able to reflect the experience on board the aircraft because we want to make sure that the levels of safety and the feeling of experience is the same going through the airports and whilst on the aircraft. And realistically, because of some of the European legislation that's in place, the mandatory wearing of face masks on the aircraft, it drives the airport experience. If we find ourselves in a position that uh, you no longer had to wear a face mask on the aircraft, then we would want to be able to reflect that as you travel through the airport. So I guess the airlines are leading the charge on when the wearing of face masks uh, will or won't uh, be, remain a mandatory requirement. And I guess it was just a question back to Jonathan. I mean, this is how long is a piece of string? I understand that, but you know, is there a feeling just now when the airlines are speaking with one another, when we may see that uh, a relief on face mask wearing in 2021 particularly? Thanks, Dave. Uh, Back to you, Jonathan. Sure. So, look, I think, um, you know, have we got a kind of airlines committee behind the scenes that decides this stuff? Uh, no. Um, we kind of went first last year and we pretty much went first this year as well. Albeit a number of other airlines went out on the same day saying they're going to keep them. I suspect that this will be with us until at least the end of the year, uh, if not through to the um, probably beginning of next summer. Uh, you can see that public concern around um, not just, I guess, COVID, but also whether there's, you know, going to be some form of increased level of winter flu this winter is probably going to point towards that remaining in place. Uh, and I, um, I personally, and this is a personal view rather than a, a Logan Air commitment or an opinion, I don't see necessarily that changing probably before uh, next, next April, May. Um, I say that's a, as you say, it's a how long's a piece of string. Um, I don't know that that will be the case and will be guided by um, both clinicians and, and public opinion, frankly. Um, you know, as everybody says, follow the data, but in some cases, the data that certainly the government seems to follow is the YouGov polling data and nothing uh, clinical uh, yeah. around what people actually want. And there is an element of that. So I think um, it, it's certainly with us for the foreseeable. There is no discussion going on behind the scenes with airlines as to uh, when this comes out. Uh, and I think right here, right now, that is a key part of the reassurance that customers who haven't flown since the beginning of the pandemic uh, wish to see. And there are still a lot of them out there. There's a lot of folk who fly very regularly. Um, there's a lot of float folk who are going back into an airport for the first time. And there's another lot of folk who are still thinking about going back into an airport for the first time. Uh, and we need to make sure they've got that certainty. So for now, I see it staying where we are. Thanks very much uh, for that. I've got a couple of questions on, on uh, electric uh, planes. Uh, one from Donal, which is just basically asking when you think an all-electric aircraft will be flying in Scotland uh, in, a, in a regular uh, route. Um, and then from David Gilchrist, um, also asking how long, uh, how, do, how long do you think it will be before we start seeing the transition to battery-powered aircraft becoming the norm? On regional routes, so it's what's when when the first one, and then when do we start seeing it become standard? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Donald. Thanks, David. Um, I think in terms of something like the smaller flights between the Orkney Islands, I can see us getting electrical propulsion in place within a couple of years. Uh, I don't think it will be longer than that, and that's the technology that we're going to be testing um, from uh, about two weeks' time up there. So for that scale of aeroplane, it's workable now to be able to do that. I think the next challenge then is upscaling it so that not just the eight-seater islanders operating uh, around Orkney, uh, it will be uh, other aircraft of the larger scale up to kind of the 50, 70-seaters that we operate. And I think in that context, we're probably looking at some time early 2030s before that becomes commonplace uh, and it becomes uh, more the reason that, you know, you're looking at going, oh, okay, electric aircraft, um, as opposed to it being uh, something that's uh, powered by conventional fuel. Um, so it's going to be in that time frame, and there are a lot of discussions about also how to refit existing aeroplanes uh, with either a battery or hydrogen power uh, to be able to do that, which are all kind of loitering into that same time space. Um, but it will start with the smallest aircraft uh, of the nature that we, we have within Logan Air's fleet in some cases, uh, and then progressively build uh, through that uh, into the much larger size of aircraft over that time. And actually, that leads into um, 
Don Donald says fantastic, by the way. It sounds like you've got the you've got the boat there. That that's good, good progress. Um, but John Glover's asking, um, will you use biofuels or some form of sustainable fuel in that transition period to electric and or hydrogen uh planes? I think personally, um, I think the biofuels, the real benefit for biofuels is around operating long haul uh services. Um be really clear, biofuels are incredibly expensive. And for the level of uh, carbon remission that you get from using a biofuel, uh, the economics of it per tonne of carbon removed from the atmosphere are a, a country mile removed from electrical and hydrogen propulsion. So if from our perspective, we were able to go straight to a position of using electrical and hydrogen, uh, that really uh, is an important factor for us. The other key problem that we have right here, right now with biofuels is not just the cost of the source of them, it's the cost of actually getting them and running a biofuel infrastructure alongside the conventional uh, refueling infrastructure at the airports to and from which we fly. Uh, Logan has 34 airports throughout the UK. We will fuel a great many of those. Biofuel, I think, is available if we do it on request at uh, two of those right now. There is actually quite a risk that we use more conventional fuel, shipping biofuel up to places like Kirkwall and Shetland for it to be there to then burn it. Uh, that actually offsets a lot of the environmental benefits that, uh, that, that, that we get from the biofuel to start with. So I think biofuel has got a much larger aircraft and really, really important role to play uh, into the future. Um, but what I don't want to see is something which says, right, thou shalt use a proportion of biofuel um, at huge cost, which then pulls away from the investment that we can afford to put in uh, to developing electrical and hydrogen, which for us uh, as, a, as a regional airline flying aircraft up to 70 seats is really where we see the future going. So I think there's a, biofuel has absolutely got its place, but I think there's a danger across the industry that a rush towards biofuel exclusively could do more harm than good uh, certainly in the uh, short to medium term. Mm, that sounds like quite a lot of investment because you need two parallel processes, one for sustainable fuels for long haul and one for shorter term uh, sustaining of uh, electric planes. That, that does sound like quite a lot of money. Where's that money going to come from? Well, I think, you know, the government has put a set of um, future flight and future projects. There's, you know, there's a there's a almost limitless amount of investment going into this, um, which is uh, is great to see because it's going to need that. Um, but I think repurposing some of Scotland's petrochemical industry towards biofuel production is going to be the next kind of big step that needs to be taken um, because the production capability for biofuel is so limited at the moment, uh, which results in the unit cost being on, on the ceiling. Uh, it's about four and a half to five times less. And so I think you know, sort of more to, 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 use, to use biofuels right now, if you can get it, which for the vast majority of cases, you can't. Um, so I think that investment probably needs to go into infrastructural investments from government uh, and a plan to do that and then uh, strongly encourage the adoption, which is already happening. Though, if you look at the carbon tax on fuel, um, so we do pay a tax on our aviation through fuel through the emissions trading scheme. Uh, that's gone up and up and up to the point where about today's levels, it represents about a 20 percent tax uh, on aviation fuel for the emissions trading scheme. And I'm sure that will continue to go up. So the incentives to switch to those when they are available economically uh, will will be absolutely clear and will become more and more compelling. In terms of the, I've got a question here from um, Yong Cheng Dong uh, asking. Um, you mentioned the ambulance service as a as a social re, socially responsible contribution during the the crisis. Um, he was asking how you managed to address the, the planet people profit bottom lines uh, due, simultaneously during the COVID crisis. That I'm assuming is going to be something you're going to have to continue to do post the crisis as well. You're giving some fairly strong hints about about that uh, in the presentation that you give. You gave how much is that balancing act, people, profit, and uh, planet, going to be fundamental to the strategy that you're taking forward? Well, I think it already is, um, and I think there's a. You know, this is where Logan Air is in an interesting position because to a lot of people, particularly through the Highlands and Islands, um, you know, which is still an important part of our business, albeit today it's by no means the only part of our business. 
um, it's almost seen as a kind of social responsibility and an acceptable thing that there are air services there. And we have a real balancing act uh, around that between sustaining local employment, um, between the environmental questions, but also making sure that at the end of the day, we are still a business. We have got to make a profit to be here. Um, so I think, look, there, there are a number of areas. I mean, the, the, the environmental programme that we launched uh, two months ago had its origins in a discussion that um, I kick-started around the boardroom table about two years ago. Um, and, you know, it's kind of grown and grown and grown from, from, from that one discussion that we had. So I think that balance is sustained by getting the right conversations going at the right time uh, across companies like ours and also, you know, keeping an eye on what's going on elsewhere around the industry. Um, you know, you look at, uh, I think the main leader in the US from an environmental point of view has been United. Uh, airlines and they're doing actually some really interesting things from an environmental perspective so there's an element of there saying look let's keep our eyes open and keep looking out to see if there are different ways of doing things and um, you know there are uh, they work and you know finding the right ones that fit together for us to get that balance but yeah um, you you know shareholders will always have a different view uh, on on these types of things no matter what business you're running uh, of course unless it's your own which of course um, Logan, Logan Air isn't in my case um, but, uh, you know, we have got a job to do uh, around getting that balance right uh, across all three of it. And, you know, it, if you see that you've got that balance slightly wrong, taking action to try and correct it uh, fairly quickly. But from the people perspective, you know, when we've got the, the sort of highest ever level of people saying that they now see Logan Air as a career uh, and they intend to be here. I think from a people perspective, we're getting that right. From a planet perspective, the feedback we've had from the environmental program has been very strong indeed. Uh, and from a profit perspective, um, you'd need to ask our owners, but I'd hope that they would be content with the position uh, where we are today, uh, given uh, what we're seeing certainly across the rest of the industry as well. I'm so tempted to ask um, what you think about the current ferries debate. I mean, it must be very relevant to your own strategy for linking to the lifeline services. Yeah, it has. Look, I mean, it's a particular set of challenges that they, they, they have. I mean, I, we know from our own experience in Logan Air that if you do not keep investing into the infrastructure, um, then, um, you know, it, it can crumble on you very quickly. And it, and it did in Logan Air in 2015, 2016, uh, and it cost us far more to get back to where we needed to be uh, than it would have done for the investment that was saved at the very outset of it. So I think, you know, look, there are a particular set of challenges there which, um, you know, span uh, environment, um, building of ferries, uh, servicing of ferries, you know, and I think we've got We've got to, if I were to say one thing, it's that we are putting far too much time and thought into actually building ferries in Scotland instead of looking after the ones that we've got. The irony of the whole thing that's going on in Port Glasgow is that the building of ferries there has become all consuming. Let for the routine servicing of Calmac ferries, most of them have been going off to Birkenhead this winter for their refits. You know, and we're there saying, well, look, we're trying to maintain shipbuilding skills and maintenance skills in Scotland. Are we actually trying to maintain the right ones? Because, um, you know, you've got 30 ferries operating, we're maybe going to build one a year. Let's focus on getting the infrastructure right to look after the 30 that are operating, as opposed to necessarily the flagship, uh, no pun intended, uh, of, of, of just being able to sort of send a ship down the slip road in, in, in Port Glasgow. So I certainly don't envy the teams at CalMac. I think um, there are a number of imperatives which different um, community drivers, different political drivers have led them to um, over the time. And... Um, you know, it's it's a difficult challenge when you get into that place as a business. And we were there um, five, six years ago. Um, but I think it is possible to navigate your way out of it. But it's uh, it requires a level of um, uh, direction, which I think in a business where it's got so many stakeholders as CalMac may be a uh, certainly will be a challenge to achieve. But I fervently hope that they do. Ferries are just as much of a necessity perhaps even more uh, around Scotland as, as, as Logan Air's flights. And, um, you know, we very much look forward to seeing sort of CalMac in, uh, in full strength uh, and working alongside them in the way that, um, that we always try to do. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Just in terms of um, the likelihood of major structural change to the industry, uh, I've got one question here from Paul McNichol-Chung asking, is there a future for passenger flights from Prestwick Airport? 
But I can imagine there are going to be a whole, whole host of changes to the way in which um, airlines operate and and the scope for growth for, or decline, for that matter, in different uh, different assets in the industry. What's your own take on that, including Presburg Airport? Look, I think, you know, th there's always a market from A to B. And, you know, people so sort of quite often say, so why aren't you flying from, you know, here to here and things like that? And, you know, th there are lots of people who want to travel. And the essence of it for us is being able to find the markets where people, A, do want to travel, but B, we can actually make money at providing that service. And they're not always the same thing. Uh, you know, there are lots and lots of routes where people say, oh, you know, this would be really good. You know, yeah, but it's going to lose money if we do it. Um, and um, so I think that's always the most um, sort of, you know, acid test that we've got to do is try and translate that demand through into a business case to say, yes, this is, you know, th there's something here. Uh, let's go after it. Uh, I think in the context of Presswick, there'll, there'll always be a market for travel uh, from that point of view. Um, and it's um, a market that, you know, Ryanair with a base there have served over many years now. Um, from Loganair's perspective, is there a market to replicate what we already do at Glasgow at Prestwick? No, I don't think there is. Um, is there a market for us to do something else out of Prestwick? I'd never say never. I can't see what that, that is today. Um, but, you know, can somebody make money at Prestwick? Yeah, well, Ryanair have been there for a very long time and they're not don't normally do things that don't make them money uh, as, uh, you know, one of the most successful airlines in Europe. Um, so I think I would have to say, um, you know, yes, there, there is a market for it. But from our point of view, whether it's Prestwick or anywhere else, we're looking for markets that we can serve profitably and sustainably. Uh, and that's the test number one, not just that there's huge latent demand that doesn't automatically translate into profit. The last question for me, I think, to, to bring this to a close, but and it's about the future for the city of Glasgow and the extent to which the relationship between our, the airport and the city is so important. And um, what do you think the city should be doing to help the recovery of our airport and the um, recovery of the schedule, the air route schedule that we, we had become familiar with prior to the pandemic? I mean, I think recovery of the schedule is about just getting business moving again. Uh, and also, I think, uh, and it's a point I know I've made before at some previous um, talks that we've done, getting the feedback. If there's something there that's missing from an air link that you need as a company, there is no stronger um, uh, basis uh, for a business of saying, look, we know that there are going to be people needing to travel between Glasgow and, I don't know, uh, East Midlands or Norwich or Southampton, you know, these kind of routes, because this company is moving this many people on that route. So that really specific feedback about your individual company's uh, travel needs uh, and what, uh, what you're expecting to do and when is absolutely invaluable in our planning. And it's very helpful because instead of saying a taking a sort of Kevin Costner approach to route planning and sort of build it and people will come, um, being able to know that if you put a service in place, then people will use it um, is really, really crucial to us. So I think that's, that's step one. And I think then translating through into the longer term, the biggest single thing that I think the city can make sure to do to make sure it's got a thriving airport uh, is around surface access into the airport. Um, it's uh, an, an Achilles heel. I think if you look elsewhere, those airports which have got fixed surface links, such as a tram or a rail link uh, into their airport, tend to do much better than their peers around them. And I think from a city forward planning point of view, that is the biggest single service that Glasgow City could do uh, to make sure that it's got a thriving airport. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Jonathan. We have just reached two o'clock, so we're going to have to bring this to a close. I'm sure we could have gone on for a good bit longer, but uh, I just want to convey thanks from uh, the Chamber and I hope from the audience as well. Uh, that was a fantastic overview of all that you have been through uh, in the last uh, year and a half. Um, I enjoyed one flight through the entire uh, pandemic, and that was the Glasgow to Belfast flight. I got off in Belfast Airport, I got onto the runway, took a photograph, got back on the plane, came straight back to Glasgow. Is that flight still running, uh, Jonathan? Did it succeed? That, that's one of the very few that isn't, Stuart, I'm afraid. <laughs> but uh, no, um, uh, British Airways are serving the Glasgow Belfast city route now, um, uh, which is a, a, a long story. Um, but uh, certainly if there's, uh, you know, with lots of other places on the Logan Air route network from Glasgow, sort of, you know, Southampton, Exeter, all up around the islands, uh, a whole uh, range of uh, sights and delights uh, to go through. So uh, 
I hope that, that so even if it's just to put our passenger count and that of Derek's up by another two, uh, with you travelling out and travelling back again, uh, with carbon emissions fully offset, of course, uh, that we may be able to welcome you to do that again at some point in the not too distant future. Well, you're best probably not asking me to join the inaugural flight then, because clearly that's a, a jinx on the success. So uh, I take that very, very personally. But uh, I, I get to, to draw it to a close, though. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your support. Uh, this afternoon and giving us the insight into all that you have uh, tackled. Very impressive. Um, and we wish you all the very best in the recovery process in the weeks, months and years ahead. Thank you very much. And thank you to thank the you. audience, to all of you. Thank you for joining us again this afternoon uh, at Glasgow Talks. Our next Glasgow Talks is in September. Uh, I'm just looking up the uh, to remind myself uh, what it is that we have on the agenda. And it is... Uh, James Withers, of course, at uh, Scotland Food and Drink, who's going to give us an insight into the, some of the challenges that are being tackled by those industries, uh, some of the opportunities for the future. And I'm sure I won't be too surprised if you'll, to hear Brexit coming into play a little bit in that discussion, but I'm sure there's lots more positive uh, messages about the future for uh, our food and drink industry as well. So that comes in the 30th of September. In the meantime, uh, thank you very much again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at Glasgow Talks uh, with the support from the Glasgow University, Adam Smith Business School and from Clydesdale Bank uh, again in September. Thank you very much. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>